People think, oh, Jesus died, and then 100 years later, they came up with the idea that he rose from the dead. Baloney. A man rose from the dead. I mean, that change, if that's true, yeah. that changes everything. Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. A man rose from the dead. I mean, that change, if that's true, yeah. that changes everything. Absolutely. It proves that he is who he claimed to be, the Son of God. It means he's still alive today, which means we can encounter him and have a relationship with him. It means that because he was resurrected, we can be resurrected and spend eternity with him in heaven. It means everything. At least some people say that he didn't really die. How about that? Yeah. How about the idea that he just passed out yeah. and that he had fainted because of blood loss, heat stroke, whatever it was, yeah. and he was, he was placed in a tomb and then he revived? That was a common objection back in the 1800s and earlier. It's no longer articulated by skeptics because it just doesn't make sense. First of all, we have no evidence anywhere of anyone ever surviving a full Roman crucifixion. Uh, secondly, even a source as unbiased as the Journal of the American Medical Association, a secular, scientific, peer-reviewed medical journal carried an investigation into the death of Jesus, and this was their conclusion, quote, clearly the weight of the historical and medical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead even before the wound to his side was inflicted. You know, most of what mm. we know about the ancient world is based on one or two sources. But for the death of Jesus, we not only have multiple sources in the pages of the New Testament, we've also got five ancient sources outside the Bible that confirm that he died. Uh, Josephus, a first century Jewish historian who worked for the Romans. Tassus, another early historian. Mare Bar Serapion, Lucian. Even the Jewish Talmud admits that he was executed. I mean, this is so well established of an historical fact, you can go to an atheist New Testament scholar like Gerd Ludemann, and he'll tell you this, quote, Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. In, now, you know, you think about ancient history, there's not a lot of facts about ancient history that a skeptical atheist scholar like Gerd Ludemann will say is indisputable. One of them is the death of Jesus. He was truly dead after being executed. So, so you were right. If you want to put the stake in the heart of Christianity, yeah. all you have to do is demonstrate that not only Jesus died, yes. but that he stayed there. Exactly, exactly. It, it, Lee, l let me ask you, did you find your belief in the resurrection as the result of one key piece of evidence, or was it something that uh, accumulated over time? Yeah, it really was what I call a cumulative case. So I look at um, what I call the four E's. Um, and things like the execution of Jesus, the fact that, as he said, he's truly dead. The early accounts of Jesus come too quickly to be legend. The empty tomb of Jesus and the eyewitnesses. And when you mm -hmm. put all those together, I think the case is clear and compelling that Jesus didn't just claim to be God, he backed it up by returning from the dead. I, I love acronyms <laughs> and I love alliteration. So do so I. So you have four E's, yeah. it helps us to remember. Yeah. And Easter's coming up. Yes. And so uh, this is a maybe a good thing for us to remember sure. when we're talking to people about the reality of the resurrection. So the first yes. one you talked about, execution. Right. Jesus was executed right. by crucifixion. Right, and we just talked about the evidence for that, which is overwhelming, that indeed he was dead after being crucified. Uh, crucifixion, uh, they had to invent a new word to describe the torture of crucifixion. The word excruciating is from the Latin. It means out of the cross. They had to invent the word excruciating. It was the worst form of torture because it's uh, essentially a agonizing death by suffocation, by asphyxiation. Mm. Uh, so first he was whipped. Um, and, and let me quote to you an eyewitness account to a Roman flogging. It said, the sufferer's veins were laid bare and the very muscles and tendons and bowels of the victim were laid open to exposure. So he was in hypovolemic shock, great shock from loss of blood after the beating. And then he's crucified. And when you're hanging on the cross, it locks your lungs into the inhale position so you can't breathe. The only way you can continue to breathe is to push up. Well, now you got spiked through your feet and your bloody back is scraping against the coarse wood of the cross. You have to push up to relieve the stress so you can exhale, inhale, settle down on the cross. You keep going through that motion till you can't do it anymore and you, in a sense, uh, suffer uh, heart failure from asphyxiation. You cannot breathe. You can't fake that, by the way. You can't fake asphyxiation. So Jesus was truly dead in a horrific way. Wow.
So that's our first E, yes. is the evidence of his execution. Right. He was truly dead. Yes. Uh, the second one, you yeah. talk about uh, early accounts. Yes. Uh, what, what is the first report that we have that Jesus rose from the dead? Yeah, the first report comes in a um, letter that was written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth. We call it 1 Corinthians. And people can look it up, 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 3, where Paul reminds the Corinthians, I already gave you this, this is a creed of the first Christians, right from the first century, based on eyewitness accounts that said that Jesus died for our sins, he was buried, on the third day he rose from the dead, and then it mentions the specific names of eyewitnesses and groups of eyewitnesses to whom he appeared, including 500 people at once. Um, and it mentions Peter, it mentions James, and so forth. Um, so this report has been dated back by scholars to within months of the death of Jesus, within months. That, and therefore the beliefs that make up that creed go back even earlier. We're talking about something that goes back virtually to the cross itself. There's no huge time gap. People think, oh, Jesus died, and then 100 years later they came up with the idea that he rose from the dead. Baloney, we got a news flash that goes right back to the beginning, far too quick to write it off as being a legend. So I understand why execution is an important yes. evidence for the resurrection because yes. uh, if, if he never died, then he, he couldn't have been resurrected. Right. So we have to establish that he actually died. Right. Why are the early accounts yeah. important? Great question. So that we know that it wasn't invented as a legend later? Exactly, because legends develop over time. We know that they do. Um, in fact, the great historian A.N. Sherwin White said, the passage of two generations of time is not even enough for legend to grow up and wipe out a solid core of historical truth. We don't have two generations of time passing here. We got a news flash goes back to within months of his death. So that immediacy of that report is so important historically because it doesn't come 100 years later. It doesn't come um, you know, 200 years later when mythology and legend can contaminate the historical record. So the earliness of that account is critically important. Why is the empty tomb so important? Well, if Jesus bodily rose from the dead, we believe this was not just a spiritual resurrection, but a bodily resurrection, um, then the tomb must be empty. And is it? Well, what we find out is, when you look at history, what you find out is even the enemies of Jesus admitted it was empty. How do we know? Because we know from sources inside and outside the New Testament that when the disciples began proclaiming that Jesus had risen, what the opponents of Jesus said was, oh, well, um, the disciples stole the body. Now think about that. They're conceding the tomb is empty. They're trying to explain how it got empty. Mm -hmm. It's like if you're a teacher and a student comes up to you and says, the dog ate my homework. That student's admitting, look, I don't have my homework, but I can t explain what happened to it, the dog right. ate it. But the question about whether or not the homework is here is, is, is settled. Exactly, the ho homework's not here. They're conceding the tomb is empty. So everybody in the first century, whether it was um, a supporters of Jesus or enemies of Jesus, implicitly mm. or explicitly, everybody's admitting the tomb's empty. And uh, by the way, some people, like here was my way around this when I was an atheist. I said, whoa, wait a minute. I'll tell you why the tomb was empty. The body was never in it. Don't you know they didn't bury crucifixion victims? They allowed them to be eaten by the birds. So they threw them to the dogs. They, they wouldn't allow the, the um, satisfaction of a burial. So uh -huh. the, the reason the tomb's empty is the body was never in it in the first place. Well, I ran up into a problem with that, and it's called archaeology. Because <laughs> guess what? Archaeologists discovered the buried bodies of crucifixion victims, at least two of them. One of them um, actually had a, the spike still through his heel bone and a piece of the olive wood of the cross still attached to it, and yet he was buried. And then just a few years ago, they found another one. So we do know that some crucifixion victims were buried. And as a matter of fact, Roman law did allow for the burial of execution victims in certain circumstances. So my explanation went out the window. And I find that that happens frequently. You'll hear these good sounding yes. arguments like, oh, uh, the, the Christianity was just a recycled version of other resurrection myths. Right, and right. then you do more research and you find out, wait a minute, that's actually not true. Yes. The sources for the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ are dated back into the Old Testament of Scripture, which doesn't need anything outside like pagan mythology. It has everything it needs right there in the Jewish Scriptures yeah. uh, to have all of its elements. And things like this. Yes. Oh, the Romans didn't bury crucified victims. Right. It sounds good until 
more research, more archaeology, more more hi historical investigation is done, and then you start to say, wait a minute, somebody just made that up. Exactly. I'll give you another example along those lines. Um, I used to think, and a lot of skeptics say, oh, oh the, the appearance of Jesus risen, hallucinations. Hallucinate. They were yeah. just hallucinating. Yeah. Oh, there you go. That explains it all away. Wait a second. I'm a journalist. I check things out. I went to an expert on hallucinations, a man who was an expert on the human mind, PhD in psychology, professor of psychology for 20 years at a major Midwestern university, author of 30 books on psychology, and the president of a national association of psychologists. So this guy knows his stuff. <laughs> okay. And I said, now, Dr. <clears throat> Collins, wouldn't you admit to me these disciples didn't encounter the resurrected Jesus, they merely had hallucinations. And he looked at me and said, Lee, that's not possible. I said, why not? He said, Lee, you have to understand what hallucinations are like. They're like dreams. Dreams happen in individual minds. They don't right. spread like the common cold. Hallucinations happen in individual minds. He said, your earliest report, your most reliable historical report in the resurrection says 500 people saw the resurrected Jesus at the same time, right? I said, yeah. He said, Lee, 500 people having the same hallucination at the same time would be a bigger miracle than the resurrection. <laughs> and then he said, and by the way, if, this were, if these were hallucinations, the body would still be in the tomb, right? That's right. Oops, the body's gone. So there's another example of something that sounds good on the surface until you dig a little deeper. And your fourth E yeah. is eyewitnesses. Right. You have, you have eyewitnesses, and you talk about the nine ancient sources that confirm the conviction of the disciples that they really did yes. see the risen Jesus. Exactly, and it's important to understand most of what we believe about the ancient world is based on one source or two sources. So I'll, I'll ripple through those nine sources real quick. The creed that I mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15 that's so early, um, that's the first source. The second source is the Apostle Paul, who, said, who got to know some of the disciples, Peter, James, and John, for instance. And he says in 1 Corinthians, uh, whether it is I or they, we're saying the same thing. Jesus rose from the dead. So he's confirming that the disciples encountered the resurrected Jesus. Third source is the book of Acts that even atheist scholars will admit contains the summaries of teachings of the early church. And what's the teaching of the early church, the resurrection. You know, Peter gets up in the same city where Jesus had been executed just a few weeks later and says, men of Israel, listen to these words. This Jesus, a man attested to you by miracles and wonders and signs, which he did in your midst. You know that he did. He's appealing to their common knowledge. And then he says, this Jesus God raised from the dead to which we're all witnesses. And how did they react? They said, we know you're telling us the truth. What do we do? And they repented and the church was born. So there's Peter mm. confirming. The next four sources are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospels. There are nine appearances in those four gospels of the risen Jesus. And there's a lot of good reasons to believe that those gospels uh, contain the uh, truth about what Jesus' life teachings, miracles, death, and resurrection. But then we have two sources outside the Bible. We have writings by people who sat directly under the teachings of the eyewitnesses themselves. So for instance, Clement, he was ordained by Peter himself. And he wrote a letter to the church in uh, Philippi in the very first century where he talked about the uh, confidence the apostles have about Jesus being the son of God because of the resurrection that they had uh, mm -hmm. been eyewitnesses to the risen Jesus. Um, and then Polycarp. Polycarp was appointed by John to be bishop at the church at Smyrna. And he wrote a letter uh, in which he mentions the resurrection no fewer than five times and says the apostles, where do they get their confidence um, from the resurrection of Jesus? Because they know that he returned from the dead. So that's nine ancient sources inside and outside the New Testament confirming and corroborating the conviction of the disciples that they encountered the risen Jesus. That is an avalanche of historical data.